right, welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 93. I am joined uh, by my co-host, Omer. Hey everyone, Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum, everyone, and uh, we are glad to be back. Uh, we are still hunkering down, uh, sheltering in place, as it were. So this is our second or third, I guess. Well, yeah, second of our um, uh, sheltering in place episode. So thank you again for listening and joining and, and for the uh, feedback that we've gotten from our last episode that dropped, which was actually an older episode we did, which was the first, which we hope of many uh, of the immigrant stories uh, episodes. So thank you so much for listening and commenting and uh, sharing the episode. We always appreciate that. Uh, but we are really excited about today's conversation, one that I imagine uh, if you're like me, just sort of consuming all the information out there about COVID, what's going on. Um, we are recording on April the 12th, and uh, the conversation right now, at least on the political front, is about reopening the economy. How do we kind of go back uh, to work and what that looks like? And so um, we are joined today, uh, Omer, if you want to do the honors, by two very respected uh, physicians uh, in their field, and we are really excited about having this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me first introduce uh, Dr. Omer Shah. Dr. Omer Shah is the Executive Director and Local Health Authority for Harris County Public Health, a nationally rec recognized $100 million agency serving the nation's third largest county, 4.7 million people. In addition, Dr. Shah has, has enjoyed an extensive career as emergency department physician at Houston's VA Medical Center. Dr. Shah earned his BA from Vanderbilt, his MD from the University of Toledo Health Science Center, and he completed his residency fellowship and obtained his MPH at the University of Texas Health Science Center. He's known for his work in population health, equity, innovation, and engagement, and has responded to large-scale emergencies such as the novel H1N1, Ebola and Zika, and the devastating earthquakes in Kashmir and Haiti, Tropical Storm Allison, Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Ike, and Harvey, and of course now COVID-19. Welcome, Dr. Shah, to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And our second guest is Dr. Mir Ali Khan. He's originally from Houston, Texas, with an undergraduate studies at the University of Texas at Austin, MD at the University of Texas Medical School at San Antonio, and internal me medicine residency and tree res residency at Boston University Medical Center. Uh, he's had his uh, fellowship at, in pulmonary and critical care at Emory, and currently has a private practice in pulmonary and critical care in Houston uh, at the Methodist West Hospital and Houston Methodist Continuing Care Hospital. He serves as the medical director of respiratory care uh, there. And on a personal note, he has uh, a wife and three kids. Uh, so welcome to both of you to the show. We're really, really um, honored to have you both and look forward to the conversation. Thanks for having Thank me. Thanks for having me. I, I think I need, with that introduction, I also have to say I have a wife and wife and three kids because if they hear this and, and it's and, and I don't do that shout out I'm in some serious trouble so just just for just for the family that's mandatory yeah. <laughs> that's right uh thank you for that and thank you both of you for taking the time I know both of you are um uh obviously obviously very busy um with all that's happening um and I, I guess I should also say on a personal note um Dr. Ali Khan Amir is also my brother-in-law so my wife's brother so both this full disclosure there um, and Omer looks so familiar. I'm sure you and I have met in Houston, but uh, um, anyway, um, uh, it's great to have both sure. of you. So um, I guess, uh, yeah, to, to kind of sort of start things off, um, I, I thought maybe we would kind of take a step back. I imagine a lot of people who are listening uh, are, like I said, consuming as much information as possible. Um, if I could maybe hand it off, Mir, to you first to maybe tell us a little bit about just from a... Um, epidemiology sense uh, of what COVID uh, or what coronaviruses are, what COVID-19 in particular is, and what we know about its origins, infection rates, so on. Uh, maybe kind of give us a high level um, uh, from that perspective, um, given your background in pulmonology. And of course, we know that COVID-19 is a respiratory, upper respiratory illness. So um, yeah, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. Well, sir, sure. I mean, I'm certainly not a virologist or an epidemiologist by any sense of the word. I think Omer may be better suited to answer some of those uh, level questions. But 
you know, from a pulmonology perspective, you know, we see several respiratory viruses on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the year. Obviously, the most commonly known respiratory virus would be like influenza, which, you know, we generally see during flu season between the fall to the early spring uh, time every year. And that usually consumes uh, most people's attention uh, on a yearly basis. However, we do see viruses um, at other times of the year and even throughout the summer, we see respiratory viruses. Um, and we see people who get hospitalized with respiratory viruses on a regular basis. Um, there are myriad viruses that can cause different levels of respiratory infection. This coronavirus um, is from a family of viruses that has been seen before, as you may have heard with the SARS epidemic or the MERS epidemic several years back. Um, those were also coronavirus types. Um, this, was, this is now a novel or a new strain of a coronavirus uh, known as SARS-CoV-2. Um, and as um, you may have known or already heard about, you know, this has been thought to have originated from the, you know, the possibility of these wet markets in, in Wuhan, China. Um, that's you know, mostly what people are speculating and, and what most of the data is, is confirming thus far. Uh, what's unique about this virus is that the spectrum of manifestations is very, very wide. We have seen people who are essentially asymptomatic uh, with maybe a minimal sore throat or a very low grade temperature or a mild cough, and they can get better within just a handful of days. We've also seen people who have very profound respiratory failure, multi-organ failure with deep lung respiratory infection um, and causing very severe forms of pneumonia. So it's a very wide swath of people, um, similar to like the influenza uh, epidemics that you've seen in the past. But um, this is a little bit tricky in the sense that it's something brand new and, and a little bit unknown. Um, the way it's presenting itself in terms of symptoms, uh, manifestation, and also in terms of how we're choosing to manage these patients is varying quite a bit. So it's been uh, kind of a, a challenge in terms of utilizing both the art and science of medicine and trying to figure out how to, how to best manage these patients. Is, this is a question for, uh, for Omer. What causes that wide, wide range of responses? I mean, I've heard obviously older people are more affected and if you're in good health, you're less affected. But we've also seen, I saw an, uh, an article about a 104-year-old guy who, who made it through. And then, then you've also heard in California and other places, of course, uh, little kids actually um, getting affected to the point of death. So what causes that the, the disparity? It's not necessarily a linear 100% correlation. Yeah, and, and again, thanks for, for having me. And I think... Um, uh, uh, Merrily Khan, uh, he's uh, done a great job of setting the the context. And what, what I would say to answer your question in in specific, but also maybe uh, taking another step back, is really this this uh, recall of of what you just heard, which is this is a novel virus. And when you have a virus that makes that jump from an animal to a human, and it's the first time humankind has seen it we are playing catch up. So, you know, in essence, this is not one of those viruses that we've had for, you know, 20, 30 years. We've looked at, we have a lot of science, we have a lot of evidence, we have all the protocols in place. We know what the game plan is. While we have been planning for a quote unquote pandemic for years, this specific virus and what it's leading to really uh, means that um, in the clinical world, we are, uh, building the plane while we're flying it or flying the plane while we're building it, depending on which, you know, aspect you want to, you want to look at. And so there, um, I would say right now, and it, obviously there's no evidence of this, but anecdotally, this is probably the most studied virus in the globe right now. There is no virus that is getting this kind of attention. Um, the challenge is that because of that, and because of what happened in China, what happened in Asia, then when you started to see things uh, in Iran, and certainly in, in Italy, and then you started to see the first case in Seattle, and moving across the country. And then you started to see it even obviously in California where you all are based and then certainly in Texas. What we started to really recognize were all sorts of new uh, pieces to the puzzle. What we were learning about this virus and we were saying, okay, well, what, what happened in China, maybe it's because of this. And so now we saw it play out in other countries. Well, maybe they had a different context. Well, that context is very different than what was playing out here in the U.S. And so that also leads to the variability, not just in our understanding of the virus, because that's also coming up to speed very quickly, but also concomitantly our response, both on the clinical side, 
like a pul you know pulmonary critical care doc or ICU physician or an emergency department physician, or on the public health side. And and I think um, um, uh, Dr. Khan made the comment um, that it's the art of medicine and the science of medicine. I've, I've, I've um, equally when I was uh, testifying in Congress last year, I said it's the art of public health as well as the science of public health. And so I think people forget that the public health is a science, but there's also an art to it. And I think the variability on the clinical side as well as on the public health side is really what brings you to the variability in, in how we're responding and, and where even those protocols are different across communities and even in, in hospitals across the country. Well, it's really interesting that it's, it's that highly studied. And a little later on the show, we can talk about what that might mean for the future because you're getting all these new uh, data points and all this attention that could result in something really interesting five, 10 years down the road. But I wanted to also get a little um, a picture from both of you about what you're seeing on the front lines. And the reason I'm asking this question is both Hervez and I are in California, uh, highly tech, right? Um, vast majority of us work out of cubes. Uh, it's a high, you know, it's a, it's a major imbalance compared to what happens in a, in a, in a, uh, an average U.S. city. Um, that said, you know, because it is so tech uh, influenced, like in my circle, there's not a lot of doctors. It's all software engineers, program managers, project managers, and what and 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 whatnot. Um, but you folks, you you guys are seeing the front lines directly, and I'd love to hear a little more about that. Uh, what are you seeing every day when you go in into the office and 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 face this at the, on the front lines? And um, is there anything in that? that might be a little different than what the news is showing us, right? Um, I'd love to hear both from, from Mir and from Amara on, on that point. Uh, Mir, do you wanna go first? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, my, my job is, I'm a private practice pulmonary and critical care physician. So that means I see patients in the hospital and in the office who are dealing with respiratory disease. And we also manage uh, intensive care patients in the ICU setting, right? So. Um, basically, anybody who's sick enough to have breathing problems in the hospital setting or be critically ill in some sort of an unstable way uh, ends up kind of becoming my patient. Um, our group um, has been kind of uniquely positioned to be seeing patients both in a what is termed the highly infectious disease unit that was set up here in Houston as part of this as part of one of the health systems here. Um, so it's like a COVID patients cohort unit. Um, and then we also manage patients in the intensive care unit and, and on the general wards of the hospital. So now since this uh, epidemic or pandemic has started, you know, our thoughts have basically been consumed with it. Uh, we have closed our offices, you know, so general private practice office care has been closed for more than two weeks now. Um, we've had to completely reroute our infrastructure from an office perspective to basically have a guy who, or, a pay, or a physician dedicated every day to doing telehealth or virtual visits with patients because at the same time, all of our patients with chronic respiratory illness are still out there and still dealing with their COPD and pulmonary fibrosis and other types of problems. So we still have to check on them. So that's, that's been difficult. Uh, but then in the inpatient setting, you know, we're definitely seeing a rise in the number of cases on a day-to-day -day basis um, compared to two weeks ago when we only had maybe somewhere between, I would say, five to 10 patients with COVID. Um, now we have uh, in our, in just under the auspices of our group, uh, we have approximately 35 to 40. Um, so the numbers are steadily increasing. And that's just one group within the Houston area, which is obviously a very medically saturated uh, area. Um, and Houston has the largest number of cases in the state of Texas, I believe. Um, so, you know, every day it's going into the hospital, uh, looking at our patient lists, you know, and I, almost all of our patients are either suspected of having COVID or are COVID confirmed. And so basically we're treating every single patient as if they probably have it. Um, so my daily routine is I go in the hospital in my scrubs, I change into hospital scrubs <laughs> and then, you know, we're all trying to protect ourselves as much as possible from potential exposure. The hospitals, most of the hospitals have done a pretty good job of creating, uh, new ways for us to interact with patients, whether that be through video conferencing or telephone conferencing, um, even with the patients that are in the hospital and trying to minimize direct exposure unless really necessary. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. So just the way we practice medicine is changing and evolving very rapidly, you know, from a, from a, a 
situation where I would go and lay hands on a patient every day, listen to them with my stethoscope, even that is changing and being minimized now because of fear of spread of the virus. Um, you know, and so we've had several patients in the intensive care unit, several patients that I've had to intubate. Um, and, and, you know, you're concerned about potentially spreading the virus or being exposed to the virus yourself in that situation. Um, but we're doing our best to take protection and precaution as much as we can. We've set up, you know, teams to protocolize how we intubate patients and how we do procedures on these patients and all these types of things. Um, so there's almost more meetings going on now than there were before to just talk about how we deal with this whole situation. Um, you know, and the days are long, the days are stressful. Even if the patient numbers aren't as high as what we're usually used to, um, the, the, the patient care is more time consuming um, because of the donning and doffing of PPE, because of the fact that the hospitals are not allowing visitation. You have to spend extra time calling family members because these poor patients are there by themselves. They're scared. They're lonely. The only family they have is us, you know, to help take care of them and provide them some guidance and some support. And they're all asking, can you please call my daughter? Can you call my son? Let them know how I'm doing X, Y, Z. So there's a lot of extra things that are kind of new and different in how we're doing stuff. Um, so that's just a little snapshot, I guess. I'll let Omer speak as well. Yeah, um, I think Mira's done a really nice job of, of describing what's happening within the healthcare system. And I would just um, add that from, um, you know, from the standpoint of um, I still practice medicine, I still see patients in the emergency department. Um, unfortunately, once I uh, obviously became activated with, um, with you know, our, our uh, county wide response I had to pull back from that and you know our days have been long um, I absolutely agree with Mir that you know and that he hasn't said this but I would you know I think all of us have, have recognized this that our healthcare providers are frontline and are the heroes of, of really the work that's happening is at the end of the day if our uh, healthcare workers go down or our healthcare system goes down whether it surges or um, workers get sick or exposed or somehow have to go home or can't care for uh, people, which is what you started to see in New York City, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're really in some, some serious trouble. Uh, so I, I definitely believe that that's the case from the standpoint of, of the incredible amount of work that's happened. I stay in touch with my, obviously, colleagues and uh, not just colleagues here locally, but even those in New York and other parts of the country um, who are unfortunately going through some tremendously difficult times right now. And some of the stories that they're sharing, um, I mean, even just yesterday, I got a, I was trying to reach one of my, um, um, one of my colleagues who I had deployed uh, to the earthquakes with and um, he's in New York City. And um, he texted me, he said, um, we just finished a cardiopulmonary arrest. I'll, I'll you know, I'll give you a call right after. And um, when he called me, he was just completely, um, you know, completely spent. I mean, he was really what he said was, this is worse than any of the global uh, responses I've, I've, I've been on. Uh, and then right after that, a half an hour later, I received another text from somebody who said his mother just died uh, while he was working in the ICU in New York and then detailed all the ventilators and everything else that was, you know, that was going on. So I, I think there's no doubt about that. And I, I have an incredible amount of respect of of the healthcare team, and I've been a, a Texas Medical Center proud card carrying member as a as a physician for twenty plus years. Um, what I what I would also say is that this is a tremendously difficult time for um, the communities that we serve. Obviously, all of us have been disrupted. We are all part of that community. You know, the when we go to a grocery store, when we go to um, you know anywhere, a restaurant, uh, what have you, and you see there's nobody there, there's five cars in the parking lot. It's a very eerie way of looking at life um, for the way that we have seen and um, and are used to. And yet at the same time, in a public, from a public health policy standpoint, um, I recognize that part of that policy or that governmental, those, those actions are partially and actually uh, summarily because of what we have uh, enacted. Uh, and that's a huge responsibility. And so when I go back to the, the question about what does the day look like, the day actually uh, has a number of different geographic locations. Um, it um, rarely is at home, although it's a Sunday, so I'm home right now. But I'll tell you that for the most part, uh, I'm either at our office or I'm our, at our emergency management center. Or uh, just yesterday, we 
uh, did a, um, we had uh, just completed the build of a uh, 250 bed um, medical shelter, essentially a field hospital at the Astronome Complex, which is the NRG Center. Um, and um, we were um, giving a, you know, a number of uh, tours and, and obviously giving a lot of insights to elected officials, the media, and the community about what we were, we were building there. And we were able to build that in about five or six days uh, because we wanted to get ahead of the curve for, you know, Central Park in New York, et cetera. So, um, but what I do want to say is that on the public health side, that our teams are um, equally those heroes um, that are really, um, again, back to what I've been saying for several years is that I call it this, um, this real uh, hashtag invisibility crisis, that we have this crisis in our, um, you know, in, our, in our communities about healthcare and public health. Healthcare, we see, we see doctors, nurses, we see ambulances, we see sirens, we see white coats, we see stethoscopes, we see emergency departments, and we see the heroes. What we don't see is my epidemiologists who are working 16, 18 hour days right now, who at three o'clock in the morning are fielding calls from, from, from physicians or community members who are doing what they have to do in order to really track, monitor, contain, um, to even uh, to the point where we have high-risk populations in nursing homes and other congregate settings where they're also very aggressively going out uh, to, to enact uh, control orders. And all that is happening under my watch as the health authority for Harris County. And so what our days really look like are they start early, they go late, you, I get home usually about um, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, they've been 18, 17, 16 hour days. Um, but when I get home, then it's calls with elected officials, it's calls with partners, it's uh, other health authorities, it's other issues, uh, email, social media. And so really, it got to the point where my six-year-old um, has just stopped asking me to play anymore because he knows the answer is no. And, and that's a terrible toll, but it's not the me it's the we of public health and what you know folks across the country are doing. And I just have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, the public health practitioners who have been underfunded, undervalued for decades. And that's a global phenomenon, not just here in, in, in our community. And yet now in the midst of it, people are asking the question, well, why can't public health go and track and have all these surveillance systems and the capacity and do this quickly? And why don't they have all the technologies? And I, and I look and I, you know, I uh, again go back to those uh, congressional testimonies where what I said was hashtag invisibility crisis. If we do not raise the visibility, you will not get the value. If you don't get value, you don't get validation. Those three V's of public health is really, in my mind, the real challenge is that we have not validated the importance of public health in our communities, in our country, and therefore, in the middle of a public health crisis, because a lot of people are mistakenly calling it a healthcare crisis, it's a public health crisis. Unfortunately, a lot of those departments, uh, we're very blessed at our, you know, at our uh, department because we've gotten a lot of support from our elected officials, but across the country, across Texas, I'll tell you, there are some departments that, um, Frankly, their elected officials and policymakers were thinking about closing the health department uh, just within the last two years. And so the value proposition is just not there. So a day starts from a real policy lens level, but everything from epi surveillance, looking at healthcare surge, trying to understand what's happening in the, in the healthcare setting so that we don't uh, need to, to obviously enact the alternate care sites like uh, this uh, field uh, facility that we've, we've put together, and then testing which has also been this incredible challenge. And then in the midst of all that is communications, engagement, and really interacting with not just our elected officials and partners, but frankly, with our media and our community. That's a day, and I'm not sure if any day has been um, easy. And I also am not sure that any day has been um, the same as the one before. Uh, our department during N H1N1 was up for 18 months. Um, I'm not sure if you would recognize that in 2009, 2010, we responded for 18 months. Um, we're already 100 plus days in as a department. The rest of the, you know, the, the community or county were, were, you know, sort of watching, et cetera. But our department early Jan was, was watching this. And so we've been up for 100 plus days. My team is tired. 
they are so tired right now and yet it's a marathon and they still have to keep going and so it's a real challenge but the commitment and the mission of of what you know the public sector folks are doing right now is oftentimes um, left behind so i just wanted to share those perspectives as well yeah thanks for sharing i'm, I'm certainly in awe of what uh, you know everyone in in the in the in the industry you know in the care industry is doing um, you know, Dr. Fauci's kind of gotten some visibility, kind of become a national hero, but it trickles all the way down to everybody who's 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 out there saving lives. So I, you know, I'm I'm an on. I definitely thank all 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 of you guys who are on the front lines. Um, and and you know, uh, like uh, too, uh, yeah. And and I echo what Omar just said. And uh, um, for Omer, Dr. Shah, I mean, I think um, for, for the for, for our listeners, I think it's important to sort of underscore. Um, you know, he's executive director of public health at Harris County. This is the third largest county in the United States. Um, and, you know, back to Omar's point about California and Texas, I think what's sort of also kind of uniquely um, uh, or, or um, a commonality between these two states and communities um, is we're dealing with large populations of people, right? I mean, California is the most populous state in the country. Texas is number two. Um, I think there's about 40 million people in California, about 30 million people in um, Texas. Um, and so I think, you know, we are really fortunate to have someone like um, Omer, like Dr. Shaw on the show. Um, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, with regards specifically to the coronavirus, um, you know, when was your uh, team, as it were, wh when was the Harris County public health officials, when were they notified with regards to, I guess, when did the coronavirus first appear on your radar and you know what was the response on a local level because I mean obviously there's been a lot of attention given to what happened on the federal level and there's obviously umpteen articles and you can you know um, go to your New York Times or Washington Post or any other news outlet for the number of articles that have been written about the federal response um, but I'd love to sort of hear from a local perspective right um, and so if you could maybe talk a little bit about that Omer. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I, you know, I would say that, uh, obviously, I remember right around the holidays, um, the, you know, the, the winter holidays, uh, uh, late December, uh, right around New Year, uh, um, reading some things about some, some very troubling news out of Wuhan um, and Hebei province that was really about a, a virus that seemed to be having some lethality and, and people were really concerned and and what was really interesting is that early on um, our department we leaned forward very quickly and we notify emergency management and obviously our elected officials here's what's going on but we internally um, mobilized very quickly and 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 some of it is as as simple as just um, getting the right people either in a room or even the creation of something very simple as a a team, um, a COVID response team. At that point, it's really uh, incumbent on us to make sure that we are leaning forward with multidisciplinary folks without, uh, from around the department. And so it's our policy folks, it's our logistics folks, it's our operational folks, it's our clinicians, our physicians, our health authorities, it's also our epidemiologists, and it's our, you know, our other uh, communications and outreach folks. So that was really right in in about mid-January when that was occurring. So what we were doing was we were watching this, um, and, and, and I remember saying this, that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, but the when was unclear at that time for us locally. But I remember saying it was not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and then when it started happening in Texas, especially in, in San Antonio with the repatriated individuals that were coming in, I remember saying, okay, now it's a matter of when is coming, and then we had our first case, and it was like, okay, now it's, and we went from if, when, to it's a matter of now. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, it's not a matter of when, it's a matter of now, and now let's do everything we can. Um, what I'll tell you is the, the federal and um, the the global context made it challenging because we were getting reassurances of some things happening federally and nationally as well as globally that made it very difficult for us to plan because we were planning for contingencies because if you look at our 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 pandemic our highly uh, high consequence infectious disease 
um, plan that we've had um, all the way back to um, um, avian influenza, bird flu, or way back in you know the, the 2005 realm. Those plans actually call for very similar activities that we're, we're describing now. We were hoping, one, and hope is not a plan, but we were hoping that once in a century pandemic would not be happening on our watch. But that's exactly what happened. But number two is that we were also mindful that many of the strategies we had in that plan about closures of schools or, or, or some social distancing or activity, that those kinds of activities, we never could have imagined that out of theory, that we would actually a few weeks or months, uh, not even months, a few weeks later, that we would be enacting those very policies. Because when you have no vaccine, you have no medication, you have no silver bullet, then our only tool in our toolkit is social policy to get people to change behavior to, you know, every year we, you know, Mira and I are always saying, you know, wash your hands and cover your cough and all the things for flu, right? We say that every year. But what was different on this one was that we recognized that because of that lethality that was coming out of, you know, out of China that, you know, we say the, the, uh, the, um, uh, case fatality rate for for influenza is often zero point one percent. You can kind of argue a little bit on the on the numbers, uh, but here we were looking at one to two percent. So that right by definition is ten times or twenty times more lethal than than seasonal flu. Yet we were getting confusing information and guidelines, and so when we had an opportunity to really contain in a community like ours, I had one hand tied behind my back as the health authority. Mm -hmm. I um, did not, and we did not have the testing. So very quickly, if you look back to all those other events from uh, the time of H1N1 moving forward, all those infectious diseases, testing capabilities had gotten out to the state and local level markedly earlier in the process. Because it delayed, what that meant was then one hand was tied behind our back because we all we could go by was if you've been to a country and or you've been exposed to someone and you have these symptoms, then you should be tested. And the test would take three to five to seven days to get the results back. Well, that was too late for mm -hmm. us to now contain because by the time you got the test back, by the time you even discovered somebody was in the mix for COVID-19, the, the cat was already out of the bag. And, and now we were playing um, really catch up. And that's why we've had to move to these extremely difficult um, social policies around social distancing. We don't call it um, here locally. We haven't called it shelter in place. Um, and I know in California they have in many places because shelter in place in our community has very specific meaning around hurricanes chemical incidents, and even uh, mass shooter events, you know, active shooter event events. So we don't want to say uh, shelter in place because that has a different connotation. So we've actually called it stay home, work safe. And those policies really were enacted so that we could really ensure that our community was, again, helping us uh, flatten that curve. And that's really all dependent on, on staying socially distanced from each other. Yeah. Yeah. If I could, if I could just piggyback on that real quick. I yeah, mean, please. I I think, you know, we're really lucky to have someone like Omer Shah because his leadership locally here has been phenomenal. But the concept of having one hand behind your back is so, so crucial because, you know, even though locally you may have a health authority that's very engaged and trying to lean forward very early and be very aggressive about its own, you know, health policies, if you don't have the support from top down, federally or internationally even, you know, the level of alarm from the World Health Organization to the federal agencies to the local authorities, what happens is locally, you start looking like an alarmist. And the average person or Joe Schmo out there is like, why are they freaking out this bad? And I'll tell you, even in the medical community, from a doctor's perspective, in our own sphere where I practice, there was not the same level of concern. Your average physician out there is not a public health specialist, is not an epidemiologist. They don't have that global understanding. And if we don't receive those alarm bells from the health authorities and from the top down, then nobody takes it seriously. 
And this, I think, has, you know, even though you want to focus on a local issue, I think that the federal response, like you still end up coming back to that because, you know, having having that one arm tied behind your back, not having adequate testing, not having the sufficient level of alarm and concern from the get go just kind of hamstrings you. Yeah. And Mary, I think, I think he brings up a really good point even now. So as I said that we've, um, as, as a County, we've, we've put up this alternate care surge, um, 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 operation at, um, the NRG complex, which is, uh, where the Astrodome and the Texans, all that, uh, you know, s- a set of uh, buildings are. Um, and it's a significant investment. I mean, it, the county elected leadership, I give them a lot of credit. I mean, we, we obviously made a recommendation, but it's a $60 million investment for two months of, 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 of you know, operation. And we are getting that from folks on social media. And they're like, well, it's uh, what a colossal waste of dollars and it's going to be empty. And, and I'm actually hopeful they're right. I want them to be right. But I'll tell you, this is the, the art of public health and the art of decision making, because if, if, if we're wrong, we're wrong bad, because you get a surge in that, these facilities and our community has what happened in New York, people die. And that to me is, again, my calculus is not just about COVID. It's obviously a lot about, I understand that when you close down businesses or sell, tell people to stay home. There's an incredible disruption on social and economic, which also feeds into health. I mean, obviously, if we don't want somebody to survive COVID, but then um, commit suicide, right? right. I mean, there, there are mental health consequences or physical health consequences. You know, people are still going to have heart attacks and, and, you know, having, you know, diabetic sure. complications and all that. But at the same time, this is the challenge that if you, if you act too late, this is one of those, and Mira's right, you know, he's, he talked about how the number of, of, of cases in their ICU have, have increased or doubled. If, if in New York and other places, it was one or two or three days, things were fine. And in 24, 48, 30, you know, 36, um, 96 hours, just like that, it was surge and it's too late. Mm-hmm. So the problem is that you're, you're, and I, obviously it's a podcast that's a little bit, you know, I, I don't know who's going to watch it. So I'll say danged. I won't say the other word, D word, but you're danged if you do, and you're danged if you don't, right? Because at the end of the day, if you don't do it, if you do it, people say, and, and, and I'm hoping we do everything so we don't get that surge and we never have to put an individual patient at all in that surge facility. But if you don't do it and you do get the surge, those very people come back and say, why did you not? A failure to plan is failure nonetheless. Why did you not do it? And so you have to err on the side of health and lives saved, even if it's significant disruption. And obviously there's a cost to that all, all around. Mm-hmm. And that speaks to the, the why you need a top-down approach and somebody to take full ownership and leadership on it, right? Because otherwise you have all these different approaches and some people, some folks wanting to take more risk and others wanting to take less risk. Then that doesn't even count for the fact that the models are uh, super sensitive early on, right? One, one late or bad response puts you, on a, puts you on a completely different trajectory, which is what happened in New York. But I know Pervez was super interested also kind of in the, the political aspect as a nation in terms of well, I mean, in, in fact, we, we, I think we've talked a lot more than I, uh, frankly, anticipated that we would in, in terms of the federal response. But um, I, I find it fascinating to hear from our officials on the ground, our physicians on the ground, who say that um, how, 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 how important that, that, that is, uh, that it does come from the top down. So uh, I think that's a, it's been a fascinating conversation around that because um, to, you know, to, to, to the points that have been raised about testing and, and the inadequacy of testing, um, and this goes to something I think we'll, I, I definitely want to talk about as we, um, as we find ourselves in the midst of conversations about reopening the economy, about getting back to quote unquote life as, as we knew it, et cetera, because with inadequate testing, um, that trickles down to everything, right? And, and what we're seeing even now with some of the estimates and the modeling that we based, at least on a federal level, 
based a lot of our sheltering in place or working from home or social distancing measures, uh, you know, some have called it draconian uh, or, or not, but uh, nonetheless, they, they, they definitely have an impact, um, you know, um, economically and socially, like Omer said, uh, is that is that with, 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 with inadequate testing, you aren't able to actually get a sense of how widespread the disease is or the infection rate, how many people you're dealing with that actually are quote unquote positive. Um, and then based, and, and if that number is skewed or off, um, then, um, uh, or underflated, right? If you don't have a full representation of how many people are actually infected in a community, then your mortality rates and, 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 and morbidity rates are also, um, uh, then over, uh, you know, like they're inflated because of the fact that you've gotten essentially your denominator wrong, right? In terms of what population you're dealing with. Um, so I guess with, with, with all this conversation, I think it was Friday, um, Governor um, Abbott, you know, uh, Texas governor, um, you know, uh, was uh, entertaining conversations around uh, getting back to life as, you know, or life as we knew it before um, and going back in a safe way. Um, uh, and, and, and I think there's been conversations around possibly um, ramping up testing, drive-through testing, et cetera. Um, what are you seeing, Omer, uh, in terms of um, how we've reached capacity with regards to, or how well we're doing with regards to that number of testing uh, individuals? Because that is going to lead to a safe return to life as normal, right? If we can get the kind of testing that we need. Well, it's, it, it certainly helps. I mean, I think the cat's out of the bag. I mean, I think part of it has already happened. I mean, unfortunately, community transmission is widespread enough that now at this point, it's very difficult to know um, if you're ever going to catch up from the testing side. But that's your pe best hope, right? Your best chance is to test as many people as you can for two purposes. One, to contain or be able to uh, be have a better understanding of what your actions can be. Uh, especially if you have a, a at-risk group like uh, seniors in a nursing home, et cetera. Uh, but number two is that it also gives you some surveillance information where you can all now start to really do some some significant modeling where it's uh, it's really based not on, like you said, the denominator of unknown. You actually now are able to make some very uh, cogent arguments about what, what you should do and when you should do it. Now, with uh, respect to leadership at the state level, I will tell you that my home state of Ohio, uh, which is, um, you know, I want to give a little shout out to uh, uh, Governor DeWine, who I was really amazed by the the leadership that he took to really essentially enact social distancing policies so early in the process. And Ohio is actually doing reasonably well. And you got to give him a lot of credit. And what's interesting to me is that this is not a red blue issue. Yeah. This is not a uh, left-right issue. This is not a conservative and, and liberal issue. This is really, there have been governors and there have been state leaders who have taken some very, very aggressive, assertive policies. There have been others who have, have waited. And I think the truth is that it really depends on a significant amount of contextual framework that each of those state leaders are, are putting into the mix. Um, we believe there is a significant concern that if you, if, in or, let, let me back, before I say this comment, um, uh, let me just make this comment, that in order for social distancing to work, it has to be significant enough mm -hmm. and it has to be long enough, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it can't be that you kind of sidestep into it, you're like, yeah, we'll let you do this and not this and this is okay. Not, you've got to be very stringent and say, no. If you do get together, and, and it's not like, you know, you, you, it's obviously, you know, Easter weekend and, you know, if people are getting together or Ramadan is coming and people are getting together and even though they're not getting together and the house is a worship, but they're doing it in their own home and everybody is together, you've completely defeated the purpose. So it has to be stringent and, and our community has to work with us because we can't, we can't and I put this in air quotes, you can't police that. You're trying to do everything you can to work with a community, to, to let a community know why it's in their best interest, why you don't want to have, have them actually get their own loved ones sick, uh, their own family members, their own you know, um, uh, practitioners of their, of their uh, house of worship sick, because that's obviously got other consequences, because they may die. And 
I think that's one aspect. So it has to be strong enough, but then it has to be long enough. In other words, that if you, if you don't have it for an extended period of time, what you're really doing then, you really are playing with fire. Because what we've seen is that in other countries, including Hong Kong and, and Singapore and other places, when you have actually eased those restrictions, potentially prematurely, this is the art, well, there's no playbook on this one, it's an art, if you do it prematurely, those case counts start to rebound and you start to have an increase. So testing is our best way out of this, but we have to really remember that we're not there even with the capacity. So that testing is, is, is step one. But step two is to continue to enact those policies while you're waiting for that testing to really help you decide both the denominator and the where and, and the strategies on how you're going to really get into the community to contain or, or at least protect the at-risk population while you're also then looking at this, at this community-wide level about how to keep those policies in place. Mm -hmm. so that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense. One yeah, more thing about yeah. that, though, just like, you know, what's interesting is kind of alluding back to what we were talking about in the very beginning is how this is a novel virus. And we don't know how it's going to behave over the summer with hotter temperatures. We don't know if it's going to dissipate or if it's going to worsen, right? We don't even know if this virus will respond to the concept of herd immunity and if the, you know, numbers will drop after a sufficient number of people have been infected. And so we're really just, you know, learning as we go day by day, there's something new that we're learning um, either in the treatment or the management or the public health containment of this condition. And so I think that's all the more reason why, like, we have to take these measures very, very seriously because we just don't know what we're working with here. Right. And um, to your point, like in terms of, um, uh, the like not knowing about like well I'm I'm glad you actually talked about herd immunity because I do want to ask a question uh, in terms of just defining what that is for our listeners but but like to your you know to, with regards to testing and and getting a sense of what the true numbers look like um you know I, I think also something unique perhaps to this virus uh, I, I again I'm obviously I'm way beyond my league here in terms of uh, knowing about um, you know viruses in general but. Um, the fact that you have asymptomatic people who can transmit the virus, right, at, 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 at pretty, like, alarming rates. Um, is that something that's unique to this particular virus, or is that something we see even, like, for example, with influenza or the common cold? Yeah, I mean, you do see it with other viruses, but I will say that uh, this is the perfect virus, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to if you're going to design a virus that's going to cause, uh, wreck, you know, wreck havoc, this is the one because it's got an incubation period of the two to 14 days. Uh, you've got uh, asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people who are potential shedders and can spread. You've got no vaccine. You've got no medication. You've got uh, symptoms where a good portion might be actually mild or, or not really have much. And then you've got a lethality that gets to certain populations, including especially the seniors, and those with underlying health conditions, where you have a significant amount of, of mortality that goes. That is the perfect you know, recipe for what we're seeing as a global pandemic that's causing havoc across the globe because of all those factors. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, could one of you take a stab at the, or quickly defining what herd immunity and, and because I, again, there's articles floating around about California and, and possibly other places as well, having developed this herd immunity or that the virus came early and it was undetected and people got sick and maybe got coronavirus or COVID. Some countries actually toyed with the idea of letting the virus play out. So herd immunity could build. And ah, I think I read something about Sweden, maybe, yeah, or something like that, yeah. Norway, yeah, Norway, Norway. and the UK as well, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, so and Amir can, can jump in. There's just a very, uh, from a public health standpoint, herd immunity is this concept of you either uh, have enough people that have been exposed to a virus and or you have vaccinated enough people so that they have developed the, the um, antibodies to a virus. And so with that, uh, what happens is that now if individuals who have not been exposed to that virus now actually get exposed, you have a herd of people around that in, in essence can cocoon or protect and you don't have a lot of spread because you've got it. And this is why, you know, for when measles rates were, you know, significantly higher, 
then you were really not getting outbreaks of measles because you had enough herd immunity, but enough vaccination. That's the key, the vaccination. Here where um, the, the idea is about, it's the percentage of people that would potentially need to be um, exposed so they create their own antibodies. The problem, and Mira just mentioned this, which I think is, I don't want to um, gloss over it, so let me make sure to reemphasize it, that because it's a new virus, it's not, it's not like measles where you get this lifelong immunity. This is really a situation where you're going to have immunity potentially for a shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. And so what we don't know, and this is what the real concern is, that we have potentially reinfection that might happen because your body for a couple of months may know this body, this, this virus, but then three or four months, now there are also a couple strains of it, so that's another issue, that yeah. you might actually have another situation where you might get reinfected. And so I think that's another uh, area as well. And then you don't have a vaccine. So there you go. So now you're really, you're, you're, you're really saying, okay, well, how many people do we think in our community are really infected already, exposed, percentage-wise, because you're doing a calculation because you don't have the results, you don't have testing. And then how do you then figure out when do you reopen? Because then you know that's going to start to increase the, the mixing of people and exposures. But at the same time, you're trying to protect those who are most vulnerable because you know they're going to be most likely to have a complication and, and die. Mira, I don't know if you, you wanted to add anything to the, that concept from a clinical standpoint. Uh, no, you know, I mean, I think that you, you nailed it on the head. I mean, I think we're hoping in these coming weeks that we will have antibody testing, um, the actual immunoglobulin tests, which is a blood test to kind of see if people have had exposure to the virus or developed some level of immunity. So I think hopefully that will inform us a little bit more over the coming weeks and months as to what level of quote unquote immunity we've developed. But again, like Omer said, you don't know that just because you have the antibodies developed in your blood, that that's going to be a lasting impact the way it would if you had, you know, measles or mumps or something as a kid or chicken pox as a kid. That's a very different scenario. Um, so just like you can get infected with influenza this year, you can get infected with influenza again next year, right? So viruses have, you know, genetic drift and shift and they, they, they can alter their genetic code slowly. And so we don't know how this virus is going to evolve over time. Well, that's a bit scary to hear that it evolve and, and, and that, that light at the end of the tunnel, you know, maybe further away than we think. Um, I do want to do a quick time check for, for Dr. Shah. Uh, I know your days are like back to back to back, uh, even on weekends. Uh, you, you were mentioning you had a, another commitment. And I think you're, I think you're on mute, Dr. Shah. Well, that makes it a lot easier for me not to answer the question. Uh, so, <laughs> so I've I've got actually I'm I'm okay right now because uh, they texted me that uh, they're running a little bit behind, so I've got a few minutes. Okay. Uh, but then I can um, I might have to signal to you that I I hey guys I'm I got to yeah. run, but uh, I got a few minutes. Well, one one thing that just um, to dive into as we as we get closer to the end is like what's the long term long long term far down the road? I mean, there's some. Again, coming from a Silicon Valley point of view, I think in terms of technology impacts where, you know, all the things that are moving virtual and, and what about from a public health and a, and a and medical point of view? What's the long-term impact? What do you hope for and, and what do you actually see happening? Well, I mean, yeah, I, go I'm ahead. sorry. I, I was just going to ask maybe to sort of piggyback on, on Omer's question um, and going back to something we've been talking about, which is testing, because to me, and, and, and this is probably as overtly political as I'm going to get, uh, on, at least on today's episode, but um, is, is that, um, well, at the same time, while we're talking about the need for uh, ramping up testing and different kinds of tests, you know, we're talking about drive-through testing, the frequency of testing, the antibody testing, et cetera. Um, and at the same time, the federal government's telling us, well, we're, we're actually not going to, we, we don't see the, uh, the, like the need to actually continue funding uh, testing. So that, that to me, how do you reconcile that on a, like on, on a federal level? I don't know and what that looks like and how that dissipates down to a local level. Um, and so maybe you can kind of speak to that as you answer Omer's question about, you know, what do you think? What does this look like through the summer, into the fall? And then hopefully, you know, is there the light at the end of the tunnel being a vaccine come, you know, early 2021? 
Yeah, you know, I would say that the uh, first disclaimer is I don't have the crystal ball. I wish I did. Uh, I've, um, I've, I've done my best, and I'll be honest, uh, uh, the ball, for some reason, keeps getting lost somewhere in the house. I, I'm, I'm still looking for it. Um, there is a real challenge uh, that we have, which is that most likely there's, at some point, there is going to be a decision about um, loosening up those restrictions. And um, it may be because policy-wise, it's the right decision. Um, I am concerned that it may be because of political or fatigue uh, from a community standpoint. Those are equal um, issues and they're, they're, they cannot be dismissed because they're absolutely critical as well. And um, you will have then an opening up uh, in other, you know, all across the country. Hopefully it's done methodically. So you don't open up everything all at once and now you have this incredible rebound. Hopefully you can, you can really start to think through, okay, where do we believe either geographically right. uh, we can open up or sector-wise, right, uh, at food establishments versus schools, right. uh, as an example. Um, and I think you're going to start to see some, if it's done methodically, you'll start to see some increase. Because at the same time, you're also going to be seeing increased testing. So you're going to have increased case, cases that are going to be um, deemed positive because obviously you have more testing. Um, if it's done very uh, uh, you know, abruptly, then the concern is that it's actually going to be uh, a significant rebound that's going to happen. Um, there's also this whole piece about is something going to happen with a coronavirus that would have a seasonality where you might start to see it fade a bit in the summer, not necessarily because of the heat and all the other stuff that people have been saying, but just because the coronavirus um, transmission in the summer is just not typically as much, although with some of um, MERS and SARS that Mir had talked about, you, you've actually had some extension beyond that. Um, so in a perfect world, you have your policies in place, you remove those policies, and you get through the summer and things are good. The concern that I have is that if we do have waning immunity or lack of immunity and still do not have vaccination, in the fall, um, this virus could come back with an in incredible amount of resurgence that will, one, give us time, but it's also going to be quite overwhelming potentially. And that is a big concern that I have as well. So I think what we have to really do is, is think about what are the strategies that allow us to bring not just the traditional public health and healthcare strategies, but really those uh, lean forward types of strategies that in involve tech and involve, you know, um, aspects of, of innovation that we have uh, really need to bring into the mix that we've just not had time to do because it's happening so quickly. And then the final thing I would say is that there are obviously models that have occurred across the world. Um, I'm not sure all Americans are ready to champion some of those, though, with trade-offs. So even uh, today I was reading something on Twitter where there's somebody championing about uh, smartphones and the mm -hmm. ability to track and all that. And we know in our country that there has been real concerns about tracking and surveillance, not epidemiologically surveilling, but surveillance that then is used for other reasons that it goes well beyond a pandemic. So I think there are a lot of real yeah. you know, issues that are, that are really um, going to play out. And I will say finally is that we are uh, in new times. This is, uh, this is transformed our, our um, communities in ways that, you know, around the globe that we've never thought it would happen. And so we're going to be learning a lot more about this in the next several months. You know, th thank you for that. And, and, and we'll go ahead and start wrapping up. Uh, but I guess before we go, I mean, you know, we, we, we talked about recording. Obviously, we, we're, we're recording today on Easter. Um, the Ramadan is around the corner for Muslims. Um, you know, uh, at least from anecdotally, from what I've seen, uh, I think that the response, surprisingly, and if you ask my opinion, surprisingly so from the Muslim community has been to kind of follow the strictures and the protocols of closing down religious places, you know, like houses of worship and limiting services, um, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, cultural events, uh, social events, because I mean, and, and as we kind of you know, approach Ramadan, Ramadan being such a communal uh, event in our, in the life of our community, I guess, um, 
from, you know, what do you see as, or what would you advise, you know, with regards to how we approach Ramadan, um, you know, as, 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 as someone who's involved in public health and just, you know, as, as a physician and as a practicing Muslim? Yeah, you know, I would say that um, I have significant um, uh, um, concerns. Um, I am, just as you said, I'm very appreciative. I'm actually quite uh, pleased that yeah. uh, the Muslim community really, um, um, you know, was able to really come together with, you know, both hadith and, and other kinds of ways of saying, here's a reason in the midst of a plague, you can do the following and here are That's the kinds right. of things that, you know, there was a very uh, forward looking viewpoint. Now, obviously a lot of, uh, there could have still been uh, pushback. Uh, but you know, obviously government was saying, look, this is a no go, but at the same time, it's always better when, when, uh, communities of faith actually work with you rather than having to, to have something more, more stringent. But I am concerned about Ramadan because I, as you said that I think it does dovetail into so many of our real practices and, and, you know, the, the ways spiritually that people come together. And what we've been saying is look, emotionally together, physically apart, hashtag, spiritually together, emotionally uh, together, physically apart, you know, do everything you can together. Do, you know, even us, the four of us are con connect connected together right now. That's We're right. going to leave this conversation. We're connected. We didn't shake a hand. We didn't give a hug. We didn't touch each other. We are still emotionally connected. And I think what we have to remember is all these policies are really about not disconnecting people from each other because we are by definition humans that are that are animals of uh, social animals. That's right. Yet at the same time, if communities, any community, whether it's Christian, um, you know, Jewish, Hindu, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, what if a community comes together and not just spiritually, emotionally, but physically, that very community is putting its community members at risk. That's right. And the worst thing I would want to see is any community bringing people together for a spiritual, emotional reason. And now those individuals are in the ICU and, and Amir is having to deal with them and, 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 and having to care for them or having to tell a loved one in any of those communities, including those who are celebrating Ramadan together, who are now in the ICU. And now you've got a different narrative. That's that, right. This is a virus that can kill. And this virus kills. This virus has not just got a reputation for killing. It actually does kill. We are not any safer just because of a color of a skin or the way we practice a religion or a faith. We're all at risk and we have to take that seriously. And yet if we do it together as a community, absolutely, we can come through this together. And if we right. don't, then we all fail together as well. And yeah. I think that, that's a great that's really point. Really yeah. interesting points. You know, I mean, I think I've had countless conversations with my own father just over these past several weeks, trying to explain to him on a daily basis why this is necessary. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's difficult, you know, it really is hard. And, you know, I live in the same city as my parents and I'm accustomed to seeing them at least twice a week. And it's very hard for them to understand, you know, why. And I, you know, me being a physician who is exposed to these patients on a daily basis, how could I then go to their home and visit them? And, you know, it's, I can't do it, you know, it's very, very unfortunate, but, um, you know, the last thing I would want to, is to, to be the person accountable for potentially spreading that, God forbid, within my own family, you know, um, but, you know, this Ramadan, I've been telling some friends of mine, you know, this Ramadan, I think is going to be very unique, but I think that we can potentially find some very positive, unique aspects from it, because, you know, I think that we each have a communal relationship with our creator, but we also have an individual relationship with our creator. And I think this is probably going to be a time like no other where we each really hone in on that individual relationship. I think this is going to be a time where people's sincerity or ikhlas is going to be higher than it ever was before, just purely because of that craving for getting back to life as we knew it, like you said, you know, and yeah. I think that that's going to spur a lot uh, for us, hopefully spiritually in this Ramadan that, you know, like you said, Omer, maybe we can stay spiritually connected, but, you know, physically distant. We'll find, we'll have to come up with new creative ways to do things, you know? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's really well said by you both and i appreciate it and I, I definitely have in this conversation gotten an appreciation for the art of public health um so that's one thing i've, I've definitely learned but also just an appreciation for 
uh, what everybody on the front lines is going through. Like, like you said, you have parents, you have little kids, and you're still going into the office and helping uh, do your part to save lives. So I've definitely gotten that appreciation. I want to, want to thank you both for, for this good conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, wishing both of you, uh, a, a blessed and safe Ramadan and, and you guys both, uh, uh, represent, uh, like, like I said, and, and what has been said, um, you know, just the, like the true sort of heroes, um, you know, in this pandemic and, and in this crisis. And so we can't thank you enough for your dedication and the hours you're putting in and real, really putting your, your, your lives and, and in your families at risk. So thank you so much for that. Um, normally we like to ask our guests where people can find them or engage them, but I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, uh, leave you to be because, uh, you guys are busy enough, uh, without having people hound you on, uh, on Facebook or, or social media. Uh, but, 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 but you really genuinely thanking you both, uh, for taking the time, um, on a lazy Sunday afternoon or probably not so lazy for you two, but, uh, um, really want to, uh, really extend, uh, a, 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 you know, a deep sense of gratitude for your time. Now, thank you so much to both of you, Pervez and Omar, um, for the time. And, you know, thanks for including me in the conversation. Um, I think, if nothing else, this conversation should highlight the importance of people like Dr. Shah, right? A Daisy guy who became a doctor, but also realized the importance of public health. Thank right? you. And so for the average Daisy parent out there who thinks that just being a doctor is the most important thing, I think this is, this is so, so crucial for people to realize uh, and, you know, hopefully events like this, if nothing else, maybe something positive will come out of it for, you know, infrastructure and investment in terms of public health, because, you know, everybody wants it. Um, they, they realize how badly they need it when a crisis like this happens, unfortunately, and sometimes that's too late. And so, you know, hopefully we can all take a more keen eye to that kind of an issue and, and really help invest in that type of instru- infrastructure going forward. Well, and I, I you know, I, I would just back at you. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, equally um, thankful for being part of the conversation. And Dr. Khan is very kind. I will say that what he and his colleagues are doing on the front line uh, um, is absolutely what's helping us get through this. And so a real testament to why he went into medicine and why he is, you know, not just thinking about the individual in front of him, but also thinking about how the, the ripple effect of that individual on others in, in you know, in a healthcare setting, I, I think that's, it's incredible. So I, um, I couldn't have said it any better. Um, I am on Twitter at UShaMD, so feel free to follow me on Twitter, but that's the only social media I'll put out there. Uh, what I will say is that um, we, um, we have a long road ahead of us, and we have already transitioned and transformed as a community and as a people and as decision makers. Um, we're learning so many lessons. Um, the challenge is that when we get through this, and inshallah, we will get through this, uh, we have to make sure that we actually heed those lessons. Um, because unfortunately, my concern is that we're going to be on to the next thing. And I really hope that we take a, 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 a really deep look in our, in our country, our nation, our, our communities it's about what really is the value that we need to, to assign and then invest in that. Because these pandemics are wake up calls, yeah. but they're also 10, 15 years of us knowing that something like this could happen. And yet we obviously have still seen the devastation that's occurring despite that. So thank you for having me. And I really appreciate it. And I hope we can do this again. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And, and for our listeners, uh, as always, uh, do reach out with questions, be a part of the conversation. You can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence, or also on Twitter at uh, Diffused C. So thank you so much for our, to our guests. Thank you to our listeners. And we will be joining you once again on our next episode of Diffused Congruence. Yeah. <laughs>